Hey, it's Kellen, and today on Diversified Game, you guys are in for a real treat. This is the easiest intro that I've ever done, but it might be the most complicated. I have my love, my wife, Dr. Tina Coleman. I've known her for almost 20 years, so I can say you're going to get some medical game. You're going to get some parenting game. You'll get some game all the way from Africa from the States. I mean, her and I, we've traveled so much. She's been exposed to so much. And in a time like this, you are going to be guaranteed to learn how to become a better person and make some money. She's written books. We've co-written a book on our children's travels, London and Sydney Explore the World, that's out there on Amazon. She also more recently came out with her own book that she's on the cover of, and I say it's a great read. And even for someone like myself who knows her, it gave me a lot of insight. I welcome Dr. Tina Coleman. How are you doing, love? Hey, hey, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been overdue for quite a long time. I'm so excited to be here. All right. Well, I'm glad to have you here. And people will say the hardest people to interview are those that you know. But for me, this is just going to be our everyday type conversation. So wherever you want it to go, it shall go. And Look here. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. But I don't know if your audience is, you know. So um, there's going to be a lot of editing in the background. There has to be. Yeah. I don't think the public is ready for our conversations yet. Well, one thing they know that in our policy at Diversify the Game, we go real and raw and we don't need to edit our guests because our guests are professional, they're intentional, and they know what they want to say as soon as I give the question. And so my first question for you is, at what age did you first gain ambition? Um, that's a really interesting question. It's a little bit difficult one to answer because... Um, Ambition is not like an on or off switch. It's really like a muscle that you develop, in my opinion. And as you grow and as you become more intentional and more strategic, um, that's when you really have that taste. We get a little taste of success, even at a young age. So you do well on the test. You put in the work, you get the results. And you start saying, okay, I can see this to be intentional. Uh, for me, I started taking the steps towards being intentional about my own life probably around age 10 or 11 so that around that time probably age 10. And was there a mentor or something that you read that sparked that? Well uh, my parents probably are my biggest inspiration in the sense that they uh, encouraged us number one to speak our minds number two to be uh, they asked us what we wanted to do with our lives so uh, age 10 really was the time where I could choose because at that age we switched from what we call primary school to secondary school and so I could choose the school I wanted to go to and that was a very very crucial point where I could say hey this is that I could go to private school I could stay in public school ultimately my decision was to stay in public school even though um, a lot of my siblings were going to private school at the time so for me that's kind of like where I saw where your Actions had consequences, and you could be intentional about your life, and that really cemented the, the 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 foundations of that for me. But my parents, I would say, are my biggest ambition and my biggest inspiration. In addition, I was also very well read. My parents were journalists, and I was exposed to a lot of um, literary works very, but a very very young age. And so it was um, you could when you start reading things like Julius Caesar around that age, you see how and Brutus, like we've talked about, and I don't want to go into the cellular coin, but I can if you want me to, you know, and, and just, you start reading, I think that reading really expanded my mind as far as um, what the degree of responsibility I wanted to take on for my life. Obviously, I didn't understand all of this at age 10, but I would say the seeds were definitely planted at that time. Okay. And I think, you know, that's one of the things we have in common because reading Brutus at that age is such a life changing uh, thing. And I just remember getting in even uh, Moliere, you know, um, reading him at that, that age. It, it's, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moliere, you mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. That sounds good. 
didn't know you were fluent in French. <laughs> I, I wasn't fluent, but just going through and getting a grip of the language. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yes. And, and but you know, you even choosing schools took a little bit of you know rebellion because private school in the all around the world is privilege, especially when you had parents who were busy like yours. So you were pushed to go into like a private boarding school. How did you know that if you ran away, that you would not have to go right back? I think it comes down to basically upbringing. My parents were very, um, I, I would say very liberal, uh, cons definitely considering uh, other African upbringing. And I like that they included us in decisions about us. They listened to our point of view. They didn't always agree. Uh, but, you know, again, if you can maintain your grades, uh, my, my argument that I made, and I'm, I'm, I'm in famous for this, for my long-winded arguments sometimes, especially when I think I'm right, I, I'm like a dog with a bone. I, to me, the thing is like, you send your kids to private schools to get a good education. So if I can maintain my grades in public school, then what is the onus upon you to then spend all this money for private school? For me, I didn't think it was necessary. I do agree that it depends on the child. It depends on the, it, each individual child is different. And I, I, I do appreciate about my parents in the sense that they didn't try to compete, try the children compete against each other. And I was never really compared to my other siblings. Or, and I don't think they were compared to me. I think um, everyone just had their path and everyone had their idea of where they wanted to go. And if I felt like something was, I, I was, that was my conviction, was like I didn't think going to private school would make me get better grades. I could get good enough grades going to public school for one tenth of the cost. And to me, there was no reason to mortgage my upbringing into a set of nuns or other people that I particularly didn't care about. So I, I was very frank and adamant about that. And I did, I kept my grades, I kept my end of the bargain. So I think my, my parents ultimately were okay with that in the long run. And was it just being away from home that you didn't want to go to the the private boarding school where many of Africans find long lasting friendships and, you know, they have all these stories about when they were together in, in boarding school or, or what was it that made you say, I just don't want to be here? They want I uh, yeah, I, I, for me, it wasn't, and you're right, uh, my siblings that did go to private schools and boarding schools tend to have formed this lifelong friendships and be, for me, I didn't want to, I wanted to be exposed to the real world as much as possible. I didn't want to be in some point social experiment of, this is a school with only girls, a, a class size of 10, and if everyone's perfect and dresses the same, no. People are richer than you. People are poorer than you. There are distractions in real life. The boys around you in real life. And, and to me, it was just like I wanted to be in, I didn't want to be in this alternate universe that I would have to adjust to after I graduated high school. So for me, it's like I want the real world. I want real life. I want to see what catching a cab is like, dealing with rush hour traffic, being able to be self-disciplined enough to say, hey, I'm studying because this is, I'm going to study from this time to this time, no matter what's going on. Uh, and so for me, it was not so much about being away from home. I mean, my parents traveled a lot. It wasn't as if I was staying there to be with them. They, spent a, they were journalists by training, so they did a lot of traveling. For me, it was the autonomy and having the option to, to make decisions about my own life. I did not want to be in to me, in my brief visit, it felt like a, a social experiment where a bell would ring and everyone rushes in one direction and then it rings and everyone's doing this. And they're like, at 8 p.m., you're going to do this. And not to rag in boarding schools, it, it does give kids a lot of discipline, a lot of, uh, it keeps, it, it lays a good foundation for some children. I just wasn't one of them. I always, not always, but I was very clear about what I wanted and I was adamant that I was disciplined enough to get it. And my argument to my parents that I make time and time again is like, if my grades start slipping, then let's do that. But don't penalize me for an imaginary problem that I don't have. And that was my ultimate argument. And I think my parents ended up agreeing with me. Wow, that's, that's interesting because you also 
knew at a young age you wanted to be a physician. And I always talk about being purposeful in your strategy. So how did you come up and know that you wanted to be a physician and what was your strategy on doing that? Because you knew you you were going to probably have to do it out of Cameroon. So for me, um, again, being inspired at a a young age, I did love science. And to be quite fair, in most African households, if you have the tiniest bead predilection for math, they will say, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be an engineer, you're going to be a pharmacist. And so uh, a, a little bit of that was that. But I also knew that I loved puzzles and I loved working on solutions and on things that I could work around with. So uh, ultimately, the human body is the biggest puzzle. And having family members die at a young age because they either couldn't get to a doctor, couldn't afford a doctor, or uh, just didn't believe in doctors, <laughs> which is like three a trifecta, a terrible trifecta, I think kind of cemented that decision for me. And, um, and medicine was, it's, it's very challenging in, in a different sense, but it also allows you to be, um, I don't know, a little bit, uh, you, you are always reminded of your own uh, mortality and vulnerability and you're able to philosophize. So I like that aspect of it as well. But ultimately, it was the intrigue of like, here's a puzzle, someone's sick, it's a life and death situation, how can you fix it? How can you help alleviate pain? Those are the things that drew me to a career in medicine. Okay, I think I was in elementary school, maybe in 80, nah, I I can't remember. But I remember coming up with one of my first maybe writings dream plus plan equals goal and you talk about that in your book did you already you had the dream of doing medicine at a at a young age um did you then pre- create the plan to say and now i'm going to then go to america or europe because there were limited medical schools i like how i like how you try to plagiarize my work which men have been doing to women anyway for decades and decades of years. So just so you guys know, Kellen and I have these discussions all the time where he takes my work and tries to date it on video saying in 1989 you wrote this. But uh, in all seriousness. You're saying I'm, I, I took, we're, we'll get back to that. You're, you're trying to get something to think about, which is a beautiful thing, but I'm just saying in my right. I don't need time to think. I was ready to answer. You interrupted yeah. me. Okay. We'll, we'll I was saying that before, the devil interrupted. Not that you are, but the devil does work through people. Okay? Anyway, no. so um, dream plus plan is for goal. So ultimately, I realized that dreams are not attainable, right? Plans in and of themselves don't give you the end point. Goal are the th- goals are the things that are achievable. And so for me, it was how do you take a dream and then write a master plan to match it with that dream to write a set of attainable goals? So first of all, I have to have something to look forward to, something to aspire to, something to hope for. And in addition, I need to come up with a plan and break it down in 100 simple steps where I'm like, okay, this is a chess game. If I move my pawn that way, I may have to sacrifice that to ultimately get my king over on that side. How do I make checkmate? So it's like chess, right? So you have all of these little steps and that little step may just be, hey, I'm no longer watching I only watch TV 30 minutes a day, but you're doing that ultimately for a week, 10 years later. And so that's the foundation upon which I I based my my life strategy in my book, How to Craft Your Life's Blueprint. I think that if you don't have a blueprint, you're going to fail. And you see a lot lot of millennials and young people just flaming. And unfortunately, and so that's what really urged me to write the book, Dream plus Plan Equals Goals. We know young people know how to dream. They can tell you about their dreams all day. Their rap albums and their rap <laughs> Grammy is one of people dreaming, you know. But uh, but planning is where we kind of fall apart, and that's where that's where I get that's where I really get excited. Being able to write that plan, write a strategy that can take you through ten years span, and have you standing up and say, "Hey, I'm happy." You know, I took my shot, and I love it. Yeah, and a lot of people do have the dreams, you are so right, but what they don't have is the obsession for the goals. And a lot of times they'll say, why, uh, you know, why are you not following through? And they worry about failure 
which failure is just a time to re-strategize, which you write in your book as, as well. And so it's, it's, it's a read for the person who's trying to get to the next level. And it's a read for the person who might have felt like they plateaued as well. But, um, and these are all things that, you know, we, 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 we talk about, but when you say you want to be a doctor coming up and even in Cameroon versus when you were working at Taco Bell or Popeye's while doing your undergrad for nursing and people are laughing at you saying, Hey, I'm going to be a pharmacist and a street pharmacist. Did you get a lot of pushback in Cameroon? versus what you got in America as people not believing that that was obtainable? Because it's, 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 it's less attainable in Cameroon, in theory, especially when there's fewer you know, opportunities in medical schools where here there are so many. But did you, are, what was your experience with that? Okay, that's a very good question, Kellen. So just so I make sure I understand, you're saying um, in terms of pushback against my dreams, my aspirations, was it worse in Cameroon or in America? Mm. Uh, just to give a little bit of context, first of all, I left Cameroon at the age of 18. So uh, I didn't get a lot of pushbacks, but again, Cameroonian, uh, the Cameroonian system of education is a little bit different uh, in the sense that you have to pick, uh, either you're going to do arts or science at a very, uh, around age, probably, uh, probably age 16 or 15, probably 15, whatever grade, I think eighth grade or something like that. You pick which track you're going to go on, the equivalent of that. That's from four in the British system. And so by the time you get into high school, you're already separated within the arts and the sciences into different blocks. So you have S1 through S8 in my training. And so you have a group of people that are going to become engineers, People are going to become medical doctors. People are going to become architects. So just a different, they're like different parts of science. And so um, you don't get a lot of pushback because everyone is going towards the same goal. Um, ultimately, we knew that when I left Cameroon, I, QS was we only had one medical school. It was QS, and I think they had about 75 spots. And there were about 12,000 people applying for the 75 spots. And so the, the math obviously becomes very challenging. So while people were not like, oh, you can't make it, get out of here. It was more like, um, what's your backup plan, right? Because all 12,000 of you, and these are people from um, Cameroon as well as all the neighboring countries, everyone can get in. So it was a matter of what's your strategy? Um, are you going to try to get in Nigeria? Are you going to go to South Africa? Um, are you going to go to, uh, to London, US, wherever? So people were just realistic in that sense and say, hey, we're not gonna put all of our eggs in one basket. But I will say that out of my class of my classmates in my in high school, most of them did become physicians and did achieve that because it's different because that's all you do. We did five subjects for two years. It's math, additional maths, physics, chemistry, and biology. And that's all we did for five years. And so in in that sense, when you do that, I think we were prepared. So no, I didn't get a lot of pushback in Cameroon. I instead just got a reality check of saying, what's your backup plan? In America, on the other hand, it was, I did get a lot of, of pushback and I wasn't used to it. I thought it was hilarious, especially since I went to an HBCU and people are like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm like, what, what, what does it cost you if I say my dream? You're acting as if I'm charging you for me dreaming my dream. So it was very, uh, it was a little bit strange, but I also realized that um, a lot of the people who did do give me pushback where older people they were not young people my age they my age were like cool we love it let's do it it was the older people that were a little bit disappointed with life and this was again a very small small minority of people it was a very small minority of a minority group of people um so i wouldn't say that that was my overarching experience i had a lot of instructors a lot of teachers a lot of professors who encouraged me and friends as well yourself included so I don't think that, um, I wouldn't say that in my ultimate, if someone wrote the story of my life, they could say, I got a lot of pushback. Oh, you know, it was, I had to fight my way up. No, I just said I was going to be a doctor. People were like, okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, next case, I'm going to be a rapper or whatever. So that's kind of how it went. Except for the one guy that I worked with at, at Taco, at, was it Popeye's, we referred to. He told me he wanted to be a street pharmacist. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. I'm like, oh, did you take the PCAT? And he laughed and laughed and laughed. I was like, what kind of pharmacist doesn't know what a PCAT is? 
which is the admission test for pharmacy. And I ended up calling you. I'm like, what's a street pharmacist? Is that like a, a, a mom and pop shop? And you were like, no, nah, that's like a drug dealer or something, which I thought was hilarious. I, that, that conversation went over my head the entire time. Yes, and, and don't, don't, you know, think that once we sell the story to Hollywood, they won't have you with the cane and you'll be, they'll have the homeless story. They'll have the uh, <laughs> sleeping in the garbage can. <laughs> so, so don't, you know, uh, all type of stuff that never happened because they always say inspired by. Some of these events were inspired by, but. That's uh, why I'll let you do your magic and do your work, you know, me. If I'm in a meeting and you're making up garbage or crap, I'm going to be like, I'm out of here. I don't need this one movie. And look, listen, I can tell the story better than you. I'm out. That kind of negotiated and I'll let you do your magic. But no, I didn't. I, I wouldn't say that I had to deal with a lot of haters. And then also my personality, I think personality is a big difference where even if I did, I wouldn't remember. You know what I mean? Because I, I, I delete things so much, so much. And that's something that you and I talked about <laughs> quite a bit. But I don't, I don't remember a lot of haters at all. I don't. You were there for half the time. I mean, I've known you for almost 20 years. Do you think I had a lot of haters? No, but I think that the more you do, the more you grow. Um, and that's just a natural thing. And, you know, my part of my job is to try to block that and do things so people can um, not even have you know, those issues. And I don't want to give the people a game overload because I see this is going to be kind of like a series talk. And the stuff that we're talking about, it's kind of like reading the book, the future is faster than you think. They need to stop, ponder in their own life. Because especially during these times of like lockdown, I, I've, you know, I've been saying we've all had a chance to study what we wanted to study. By the grace of God, I'm able to do what I knew at 12 that I wanted to do, and I had it written down, and, and you've seen the booklets, and you know, you've even tried, helped me throw away some of the booklets to say digitize some of these things, but it wasn't an easy route, and your route wasn't easy either, but I want people to stop and think, because it's never too late to go back to school, but while we see all these herbalists turned medical experts, they need to then jump back into somebody's medical school where they can get, they can prove what they're talking about. And I don't want to give the people an overload, but I do want to ask you a question. And I may ask it every time we do these series, what is your community give back that you're doing or that you want to do? So um, the, we've all seen the rates, right? We're talking about specifically, if we talk about the coronavirus. So let me start with the present and then go to the recent past and then do, an, uh, do a further back. So right now, more black and brown people are dying from the coronavirus. And whereas uh, the, 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 some of the most popular YouTubers or the people that they listen to were saying, oh no, black people can't get it. Melanina says it's, it's a prevention against it, which is preposterous and useless. The problem is, number one, poverty, endemic poverty. You have social issues like access to health care. So all things that keep me up at night, and you've known this, we've been talking about this for 10 years. We've been saying we have a nursing shortage, 2.2 million nurse shortage in the country. I meet black and brown people who look like me and you all the time. My goal is to inspire them to consider careers in healthcare. I know people who are broke who are asking me for money and I'm telling you, go get a CNA job. It's two weeks training. You can start making as much as $15 to $18 per hour. And they have 110 excuses why they can't do it. Whereas they take their grandma to dialysis, they watch everybody's kids. And I'm just like, dude, go get the training and get paid for stuff that you already do. We excel in healthcare. We, people of color excel in healthcare. And so for me, my give back that I'm doing is basically trying to increase the numbers and showing the possibilities that we have. Ultimately, if you increase the number of black and brown doctors in most countries, healthcare for that subgroup gets better. And that's one of the things because uh, uh, historically, and I'm gonna go back with things like the Tuskegee experiment, you've had issues where people have a mistrust of the establishment, they have a mistrust of medicine, of healthcare, of government. 
And so we as black and brown physicians, we should stand in the gap and say, hey, come on over to this other side. And uh, just to be clear, the herbalists, there's, there's, a, there's a place for them. You know, they, there's naturopathic medicine. You don't have to go to an allopathic or osteopathic medical school. So you don't have to be an MD or DO. There are MDs. If you want to be a naturopath, hey, go get a naturopathic doctorate or whatever. And you guys can, people can come see you within those confines. But it becomes dangerous when people are relying for healthcare decisions on YouTube and Facebook brands. That's preposterous, that's unacceptable, and, uh, and that's just a small part of the problem. The other issue is economic and access to medicine. We need more people of color in medicine to move these numbers. Black doctors are only 2%. 2% of black and female doctors, 2%, 2%. 2%. Those numbers are disparaging. We need to move that number up. And now you're looking at a 2.2 million nurse shortage in 2020 before the coronavirus hits. So that's even gonna put us more in the negative and we need to catch the gap. So anybody that's watching, anybody that's listening, if you're interested in the career of for healthcare, hit up my company, CNA2MD. And even in the name of the company, it tells you about my commitment to uh, public and community give back. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna open my blueprint. I'm gonna show you my playbook and show you how I did it and show you how you can do the same. And this is not a new thing. This is something that you and I have been working on for the past over a decade. And that is- oh, Almost a decade, yeah. That is good game. And, and we, we're gonna do this again. But so you guys don't get a game overload. Make sure you look in the description box. You'll see all the links for CNA-MD. Also, how to get the book, hear the testimony and how you can do it too. That's the whole purpose of Diversified Game, to show you how you can do what others are doing and go beyond. So you don't have to start from ground zero. You'll have mentors and various things. So thank you, Dr. Tina, as you are most known for out there on the streets. Love you and talk to you soon. Thank you for having me on the show, Kellen, and great job in leading uh, this group of radical and diversified entrepreneurs as they get the game on your platform. Great job, babe. Thank you.